I've been given the sleepy hour slot here, so I have two threats. Um, one is, if more than 40% of you go to sleep, we're dropping the temperature to 38 degrees. <laughs> and the other is, I have a laser thing here, and I'll go for your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to pause for a moment just to honor two people that are very special, that are among two of the finest humans on the planet. John Dexter Fletcher and Marilyn Adams are people that I've worked with for decades. There are other great scholars here, but I'd like them to stand for a moment and have you, Dexter and Marilyn Adams. These One could go a lifetime and never find another two like this. They are so outstanding. It is, they are truly uh, remarkable humans in the, in the greatest sense of the word. They love education. And even though Dexter is sold out to the defense establishment, uh, <laughs> um, I have quite a few on my slides. I've put a fair amount of detail at times. We will not linger here. That's so later. When you go on the web page, we'll have all the slides, and there may be research data. Like when I get to Hart and Risley, you, it just takes a certain amount of prose because they were prolific. So I think that there's no option there. But um, so I'll don't try to understand everything. I just wanted to make sure you had that. If you enjoy the presentation, I also am about to publish my first book on the, on my saga. And you'll be getting part of it today. If you want greater level of detail, you can sign up for the book on the way out. It's being published in a few weeks. And we have a special 50% offer off for conference uh, attendees. Now, um, like Dexter did, I'd like to tell you where we're going to end up. As I, as I muse over a lifetime at this, uh, and I'll be 79 next month, so it's been quite a while. Uh, still working full time on it. But the thing that I'm coming to is that when you tell me what your dream is about children, I'm starting to come down to one issue. Uh, I, it's kind of a Houston test, which is, okay, what percentage of the day are those children working specifically under instruction to master the things that you believe are important? And what you'll find is that most of society is not thinking that way at all. They're thinking of schools in general or classes in general. But if you analyze that apparatus, you find there's very little of it. And so like Dexter and Marilyn and others, I've come to the same conclusion that we will have to have great software, which for just a few minutes a day, will be able to build a, a, an extraordinary civilization of educated systems in the future. With that as a start, let's get on. A little of my background, raised in the Bronx, born in 1932 in the Depression. I went to two public schools, and then I switched to the Bronx High School of Science. We graduated then in mid-year. So there was a class mid-year and a class regular. So I went for half a year to the Bronx High School of Science. I got thrown out by my father. He heard me say one day, and it, great things happen for strange reasons. I came home and hit him on the back, and I said, so how's it going? And he said, what the hell did you say? <laughs> so how's it going? A few weeks later, I'm in New England, all right? At a boarding school, so. <laughs> okay, then later from there to Hamilton College, I was, I was a semi-jock, so I was able to play hockey, football, golf, things like that. <coughs> then into the Wall Street, quick Wall Street career for a few months, and then the Korean War pulled me in. So I, got a, I became a naval air intelligence officer. I briefed pilots on aircraft carriers and the tail end of the Korean War in the Pacific. I had two, two cruises, one on the Kearsarge and one on the Shangri-La. When I mustered out in San Francisco, I went right down the bay to Stanford and got a master's degree in American literature. And then I uh, later got a doctorate uh, at NYU, again in American literature. College English teacher for eight years at Brigham Young, Vassar, and Pine Manor. Then headmaster of the Spence School for eight years, so eight and eight. Then founder and chairman of the Waterford Institute when we started it in September of 76. 
till the present, and I founded a spun off of a for-profit YCAT systems company, again, eight years, and this one we raised about $100 million for, to try to launch the software and computer uh, business. It slowly faded, but, um, and it was sold finally to another company for $115 million after I left. Nancy and I co-founded the Waterford School. My wife runs it. She's a brilliant administrator. Six children, 15 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, and one Westie. Four sections of freshman English started my career. I had 100-plus students to teach, 25-plus per section. And this is where I had the first cataclysmic moment where I realized what I would now say. We don't realize that teachers are manual laborers. We've, we've put technology in most systems, but not in teaching yet. So the only technology in teaching is chalk and boards, or nowadays we get these pretty colors we put on with whiteboards instead, although the inks run out all the time. Give me all solid chalk and I'm much happier. But we have some technologies that help us, but mostly it's still a manual process. And I discovered this the hard way. I had lecture preparation for, the, for 12 hours of teaching during the week. I had, was paid $4,400. I worked on Saturdays till late afternoon. I could put about 10 minutes in in the paper and twice a term a 15-minute conference. And that was all I could do. And then I ran out totally of all energy and ability to go beyond that. I also found that I could not teach the children beyond a certain point. I had enough time using Dexter's phrase to find the errors, and I could write the errors in red ink on their papers, but the males counted their errors, you know, looked at the red marks and threw it out in disgust. The girls were mostly a little more careful. They would do a little grading of it, little changing of it, but there was no way to get around that. So I got them to the point of identifying the problem, but I could not bring them home and, and make it really work. I couldn't make them great writers. So I could not generate enough work to change student habits. I could not generate enough, but I could generate for the errors. What I needed was an extension of myself, currently called an avatar, to provide individualized interactive instruction for each student. I used to mutter to myself late at night going to sleep, I need a machine. Now remember, this is 1958 or so. This is only 10 years or 12 years after the invention of the first computer. So I knew nothing about computers. And I heard about them, but I didn't have anything to do with them. But I could just sense, if I could take them when I got them to knowing what their errors were, if somehow a machine could take over and say, that's a comma splice, a hand reaches out from the machine and grabs them by the neck, you know, <laughs> shakes them and says, you know, in your last four papers, you've had 11 comma splices. This time, you're going to get it right. You could even name the papers, all right? So my dream someday is to write that software. I haven't got there yet, but... I then switched to, a, to this Pine Manor for three years where I was chairman of the department. Then I moved to New York City to learn a different age range. I had five daughters, and so I became headmaster of a fine girls' school in New York City. Then we had a problem and had Benjamin, but we broke a, we broke a strain of, of great girls. Early in my career, I was invited to a retirement party by a, a lovely fellow headmistress, and she, uh, I belonged to the Headmistress Association of the Northeast. I just want you to know that was one of my <laughs> claims to fame. My dear, I heard an elderly alumna say, they've hired a boy to run the school. In those days, Spence was known as French. If you had a French accent, all right. But if it wasn't Parisian French, you were a failure. Our school was located on the, where the tennis court of Andrew Carnegie had been. So we looked out over the Carnegie mansion. This lady got up and said, I'm 80-something years old. I'm retiring. And it's not because I don't love my work. She just said, I cannot handle one more reform movement. <laughs> and she took the favorite reform I was thinking about, and she said, now in 1918 we called it this, in 1926 it came through again and they called it this. In the early 30s they changed the name to this, and she went on and on and on, and listed all these reforms. 
and then had they were renamed, and she said, I can't stand it anymore. I'm quitting, so I don't have to face it. And then she stood up and, you know, little high quivering voice said, don't let the bastard suck your blood dry. And she sat, <laughs> she sat down. <laughs> You've gutted my reform. <laughs> and that was the first clue I had that there were problems with reforms. In my lifetime, I've seen the movie and wept over Jaime Escalante and, you know, stand and deliver. But the problem is, is that he burned out, had a heart attack, and died miserable because he could not generate enough work to get beyond the few kids he would work with, and it bothered everybody else that he was that, he'd spent that much time. Debbie Myers took on Harlem and built an absolutely magnificent school in Harlem, got good scores. But when they tried to scale and replicate her, the whole thing collapsed. It was just a mess because you can't. What they're doing, I now realize, is they're taking the work available in the community. And they're taking, it's just enough if you're perfect. If you meet at dawn, keep them till midnight, come in every Saturday, stretch them over the summer. There's just enough work to handle it if everyone is perfectly focused. We're not and so it all collapses. We just cannot generate enough work, like I couldn't for my English papers. Jeffrey Canada is a fantastic person in Harlem now. He's doing things that are unbelievable. But on the side, if you look carefully, he has to raise $50 million a year to supplement his program. <laughs> Not many of us can raise $50 million a year to supplement our program and make it work. So there's no example, do you see? So then I looked at the classical reforms. When I was very young, Madeline Hunter did something called PET. Benjamin Bloom did the Two Sigma problem in Mastery Learning. Marie Clay, Reading Recovery. Henry Levin, Accelerated Learning. Robert Slavin, Success for All. James Comer, The School Development Program out of Yale. Ted Sizer, Coalition of Essential Schools. Marilyn Adams, Open Court and Soliloquy. So, what happened is I saw these reforms, they come, and Slavin, of all people, wrote a paper about the 12 steps from the start of a reform to its collapse. I've been tracking his reform, because <laughs> his is success for all, to see if it's holding with him as well. But in any case, what we sense then is that having reforms are very difficult. It's not easy. Nothing seems to work. My life changed when I bet my daughter's $3 in a chess game. My daughter Carrie said to me, Dad, you owe us three bucks. Put a penny on the first square and double it every square left on a chessboard, and we'll take that instead. And I thought, well, I'd like a little encouragement, one cent, two cent, four cents. I, I may cost me a few dollars. Well, I owed her 92 million billion dollars right, at the end of the 63 doublings. Boy, you said the word doubling to me after that. I went into a fit and broke out in cold sweat, all right? <laughs> Late in the evening at Spence one night, it was after midnight, I'm reading away, and there's a paper I've gotten on computers because we're getting into that. And uh, this engineer writes all these diagrams and says, thus we see, and I said, you jackass, why don't you write in English, you know, equation, equation, thus we see. I thought, wait a minute, you have a PhD in English, you should be able to read it. So I banged my head and I was embarrassed. I had talked out loud and I looked around to see there wasn't any janitor or something. And then I read this and it changed my life. And what he said was, the number of transistors we can use on a chip will double every two years. And the word double, I just went like this. You know? <laughs> and, I, and when I quieted down, I realized this is called Moore's Law. Dexter threw it around carelessly. He's he doesn't really care about the facts, you know, but <laughs> Moore's Law, Gordon Moore co-founded Intel. In 1965, he wrote an article on it, and he said, you know, I'm, as we begin to put transistors on a chip, we can put quite a few on, and I'm noticing it doubles every two years. So 25 years after the first big computer, the ENIAC, had 18,000 vacuum tubes, it was 30 tons. Intel built its first one, an eighth of an inch by a sixth of an inch, and it had the same power, and it only had 2,300 transistors in it. Okay. Absolutely extraordinary. All right, so now what's happening has been double every two years since then. And I put a doubling graph up here for you because what I want you to notice is this is called linear. That's your usual a few percent a year. 
This is called geometric or a kind of doubling that goes on. And at the knee of the curve, now what happens is these get huge. So this next year, we pick up an additional billion extra transistors to work with. Now, if it's memory, it's a little more because we're already at 4 billion transistors this year on memory chips. Now, a transistor does work for you. Think of a little worker. And when I suddenly literally have 4 billion people doing work for me, it occurred to me, you know, maybe I can get enough work done <laughs> to solve my damn work problem, okay? <laughs> you see? So I had this epiphany that night. And a few days later, I suddenly came up with a concept of a delivery system. I realized one day, musing on my blackboard at Spence, that humans organize to deliver goods and services. Most reforms concentrate on efficiency. Every one of you assumes the school is going to be the way it always is. You have a teacher, you have classes, you have all these things. That's the educational delivery system. The teacher carries the labor and so on and so forth. But someday it may change because efficiency reforms run out of effort. We've tripled our per pupil expenditure. Did you know that in constant dollars? And what happened to the scores? Nothing. That means you have a mature delivery system. I don't like the way the horse is riding on the Pony Express, so I work harder on it. Maybe I can get another tenth of an hour out of it. They average 10 miles an hour. But that's unlimited, do you see? I can't, I, I, I can't get beyond increasing. The riders couldn't be over 125 pounds. Did you know that? They carefully designed the, the mail pouch for literal little wind resistance. They did everything they could. We hooked up the telegraph. It went. 67 million times faster. So all of a sudden, the Pony Express folded in two days, all right? Now, it doesn't matter how efficient they tried to make it. If your delivery system shifts on you because you introduce new work functions, then all of a sudden. So that's what I suddenly realized. And the technology doubling every two years, I just got more and more excited. So I wrote this equation on the board. I said, hey, DH. My wife calls me DH when she's mad at me. So total useful work. That's what I'm really after. I need more work in my system, OK? So I provide the work, and there it is. Now, if I fill the equation in, you're not always efficient, all right? So efficiency is part of it. And efficiency never can add to it. It can only salvage it. Do you understand that? If you put one for efficiency, then it's 100% of that person's work. It's never that good. I would say a bad school is about a 0.3, and a good school is about a 0.7. We never get to the doing the best you could possibly do. So that's my range. And then I realized there's this leverage factor, which is traditionally technology. And so here it is with transportation. Workers, efficiency, leverage factor, transportation potential. First we walked, then we used water, then we used wheels, then an animal, horses. Out here you say horses, just if you want to be part of the group. <laughs> Railroad, car, airplane, and rocket. So here's the thing. Any one of those delivery systems that have a pop like that, they've made a quantum leap on you. See that? Once there's a quantum leap made, there's no sense trying to make the other more efficient. And we've got a school system, an entire system, mesmerized by the idea that it's going to stay constant. I run a good school, I'm more efficient. Oh, look at our scores, all right? Here's the other group. The bottom, it's like a sine curve. The bottom group, here I'll show you. You see right here that the bottom part here is the poor schools. The top part are the good schools. They all cycle in and out over the years, but it averages this. So the delivery system averages that amount of work. So there, we're always struggling. All our money's going to this right now. You name your reform, and I'll say it's right there. Meanwhile, this has happened. See, we've just popped. We can get access to an infinite amount of energy. Is that, can you follow that? Any, is that, am I confusing you? I'll move on if I am. They even put simple diagrams in for me. Boat, horse, train, car, airplane, rocket, do you see? But it's a quantum leap. And gussying up the damn Pony Express did not solve the problem. They had two days and they were out, all right? Speed of light, you can telegraph, you can't compete with it. So education, look at our big doubling. We've gone from spoken language to written language. 
manuscript form. Then the blackboard, chalk, pens and papers, books, okay? Overhead projector, movies and TV, and finally computer software. So looking at it this way, you see that we don't have very many pops, all right? Education is still primarily a manual delivery system. Teachers must use their physical energy. All education reforms concentrated on proving the efficiency of the teacher. We've reached the logical limits of manual efficiency. We have tried everything and nothing works that is scalable, period, exclamation point. Keep trying. I'd love to hear about your reforms, but they're not going to work. We can't scale them. Would you raise your hand uh, um, and tell them about your Toronto? Just put your hand up and just tell them how many years you lasted in a public school in Toronto testing on vocabulary research. We were, most of the testing was actually done in Barrie, and okay. it took oh, about five years. About uh, five years. Now, are they using it now in the school? No. No? <laughs> All right. He proved conclusively that he could produce a phenomenal vocabulary growth. Brilliant work, but it's manual. And he had to get along with the school and get 30 minutes a, you know, a day out of the class, which they begrudged for a year or two, and then they took it away because they want to go back and teach. <laughs> you see? That's a reform. And this is the best vocabulary man in the world right now. He knows more about it than anyone. And yet, what does he do? So. I'm giving you a simple equation to memorize. I won't go through it at great length today, but it'll help you later. If you want it in a one work equals the potential you have in the system times the efficiency. And what it shows is that the potential in a system, I make it up one person, the teacher. So we'll call it one person power. And then I'm going to give them about a point two for technology. They have books and chalk and overheads and uh, things that store work for them, but it doesn't do active work for them. So I give it a 1.2. So one person power plus 2.2. Now I multiply it times E, and what I'm saying is that, remember I told you the efficiency is never more than one. You can't add to it. You're trying to salvage in the delivery system what it is. What you have in most cases, the bad school would be 0.3, the good school would be 0.7. I multiply them out, and you see you end up with a 0.36 or a 0.84. I'm going too fast for you, but it's later. You can look at it in the paper if you're interested. If we change the p variable, because what's happening is that damn doubling's going on. See, the most electrifying thing about technology is Moore's law, or some equivalent. Never in the history of mankind have we doubled our potential every two years. Sooner or later, that absolutely overwhelms everything. Marilyn Adams has done absolutely brilliant research as just a subsidiary interest in speech synthesis. The computers can recognize what the child is saying. There'll be a time when the child will chat away with the computer, and the computer will have a database of every possible sound, will know exactly what the child's doing, will have looked at about 20 million children just like that, will know what to say back to the child. You'll have a tutor you just can't believe because the technology keeps doubling. The potential keeps doubling an extra billion transistors every, and now it'll be four billion and then eight billion. Remember that damn chess game, all right? So what we have is essentially unlimited energy coming. And the summary here, the bottom two are the future after you've, the P is built up because it's no longer 0.2, it's maybe a full three. You add the person power you gotta afford to deal with. You look at the inefficient school and they're at 1.2 total and yet early, the best school was a 0.84. So the worst schools are going to be better than the good schools now with the help of the technology. And what do we do when it goes to 8 and then to 16? <laughs> the P is coming, so it's absolutely infinite in size. Anyway, that's, just, that's for you to muse later, all right? Now, one, I had this incredible experience. Uh, I started working with the math department. We, uh, we put in... Uh, I really was aggressive on math and science. So we started uh, algebra for the kids, some of the brighter kids in fourth and fifth grade. And we went into calculus for some of them by the seventh and eighth grade. And it was going brilliantly. And then we got our scores back. And somebody noted that computation, we were below kindergarten level. So <laughs> we all panicked. What are we going to do? You know, we, we, we've neglected computation. So they, they can all do calculus, but no one can compute at all. So. <laughs> 
we, we sat down and I called the department together and we decided, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set this up right. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to test all the kids in September, and if there's a computation problem, we'll bet them into a section into a learning lab. And I raised money for a learning lab. I had four postdoctoral fellows. I had uh, two PhDs and 24 parent volunteers ready. And the math department got started, and we'd meet once a week with great excitement, and they spent the first few days testing the kids. It dragged on a little bit longer than they thought, but it went. By November, they came in one day, and the chairman burst into tears and got hysterical. And then they all chimed in and said, we're having a nervous breakdown. We're not sleeping. It's too much work, manual work, OK? Even to identify and get the information to the lab. Meanwhile, the lab is all burned out. Everyone is dead from the exhaustion effort, just trying manually to make a little bit improvement on the math. OK, so I think, well, got to be a better way. Michael comes in one day. He's from Riverdale, a local boys' school, and he's a very good programmer. So I called Dexter Fletcher up. Enter John Dexter Fletcher, it says here, all right? So Dexter comes in, and I have him discuss in the front of the room these math strands that he talked about from Stanford and Pat Soupies. And Michael was in the corner, and he was 14 in the back, and he took notes. Then we had to get him on the bus and off the bus all summer. Hoped he did not fall in love with any girl or play tennis because he was very handsome. But we got about six or seven weeks out of him, and he built all 13 math strands brilliantly. And we put the kids on. And we ended up getting rid of all of our computational problems by having a student spend a few minutes every so often on a computer lab doing the math strands. So one 14-year-old boy with some software outperformed my entire math department in a very critical area. Not, all, not altogether, but that, that's the first glimpse I had of the power. Judy's story taught me another issue. Judy had an IQ of 160. She had C's and A's and was surly in my class. I always teach a class. So I called Judy in and gave her headmaster lecture A. She burst into tears on schedule and promised repentance and left and came back in and changed my life sobbing and saying, you just don't understand, Dr. Houston. I didn't take notes, not because I'm lazy, but I remember everything you say. I said, you remember everything I say. Come on, Judy, don't make it worse. Try me, OK? 100% audio retention for lectures going back indefinitely, all right? Judy, how the hell do you get a C then? <laughs> oh, that's easy. That's when I can't ask questions. What the hell is that, all right? So you know what it is? If I can't ask questions, I can't tell what's important. So I don't know what I've memorized to give to them that they like. So I give them what I think they might like, and I usually miss, so I get a C. They're impressed that I can quote all these things. I'm obviously working hard. <laughs> all right, so I said to myself, good grief. Here's a girl that can remember. I can't remember anything. My children were named mnemonically, and I still can't remember them. <laughs> First three were K's, the next two were H's, and then I had you know, this son problem. I can remember saying to the nurse in the hospital, are you sure he's a boy? This is New York, remember? She whips a diaper off and says, look, you stupid bastard. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting there saying, we got a real problem. We got Judy and me in the same class. What's the teacher going to teach to? I mean. Do you realize the range of the students in a class? And it reminded me of this boy who sat next to me in a Navy school who never took notes. He was H-E-A and I was H-E-U. And I remembered later he did very well and he never seemed to take notes. Well, I realize now he had all this audio retention. But we're wired very differently. So you get into this approximation problem. Judy taught me, to whom do I teach if I'm a teacher? How do I solve the problem of all this range? It's just absolutely, I call it the approximation problem. Now, what happens is that technology always improves approximation and moves it to precision. So remember, approximation to precision. I first tracked it in bombs. They threw it over the sides of the spads in the first war when they threw bombs. <laughs> they weren't too accurate. <laughs> Okay. We had the Norden bomb site in the Second World War. None of you are old enough to remember this, but every movie I went to with the B-17s flying into Germany and kill the Hun, the Norden bomb site would be on. He'd come in with his wrist locked on in a secret canvas bag, and the bombardier would take control of the aircraft for the Norden bomb site for accuracy. All right? So they got a little more accurate. It wasn't even that accurate, but that was a big deal. In the last war, 
we've got lots of technology in our bombs now, and they chase the people as they try to get away, and lasers track them, all right? So approximation to precision. You give me more technology, I get more precision. Children, how do we approximate? Well, we start by assigning a child by the year and month of their birth to start kindergarten. Susan, what's the age difference? How did you miss by? Susan, Susan's son was 17 days just too young to start kindergarten that year, so she had to wait a year. <laughs> and it's killed her son. But, you know, we have to approximate if your birthday is this. So we start there, and then we, it's absolutely astonishing how the child's future is set up by the parent. And, and that it's not the school that has a very big impact usually. And it's not the teacher that has that much of an impact. It's the parents. So the teachers get the children and they have a real problem because they can't always fix what's there. Eaton Conant showed us that the amount of individualization, well, it's actually worse than that. Only 26% of the class day in an early elementary school is educational. They stopped watched it. They went in and out of schools and stopped watched. MBA types, you know, you know the kind. <laughs> and they came back with their data and said, well, your maximum is about best about a minute a day if it's a good school. A minute a day is 180 minutes or three hours a year. You run that out for a whole career. It's less than a week of individual instruction before you graduate from high school. Okay, so it's a lot less than, uh, than what we think. Here's an individual instruction. I broke it down for you. The red line is showing you that these are the total hours in a year, eight, seven, six, zero. That's easy to remember. Waking hours after eight hours of sleep, you're left with 5,840. Subtract the time you go to school and you're down to 4,760 at home and 1,080 at school. 26% of that is 280 hours are instructional in a school year. Of that, only three hours is going to be individualized instruction. Okay? So all your dreams of individualized instruction go up in smoke. This will be on you. You can get all that data. I've then popped it up to show just with a simple computer program. The blue represents three hours of, of, of what the school can give. Just give me 15 minutes a day during a school year, and I've taken you up 15 times the amount of individualized instruction. And if I do it all summer, too, give them two weeks off for vacation, don't work weekends, uh, I get 62 and a half hours, which is about 20 times. So these are the limits that the teacher faces, and we'll hit these quickly. Uh, and you'll want to pour over the slides later if, it, if it's of any interest to you. But the Moynihan report in 65 reported the family disintegrating in the African-American community. It said that there were 3% of the white children were born out of wedlock and African-Americans were up to 24%. It created such a sensation, they shut it down. The government ignored it. Everybody went away. They didn't want to be accused of bigotry. We don't say a word this year. The whites are up to 27%, <laughs> and the blacks are up to 72%, and the Hispanics are in the 50% range, out of wedlock children. We're producing stressful families of single women all over the place, or single men. It's up to 40% or so of the, of the people. And it's absolutely devastating. Hart and Risley solved the great society problem. From 1965 to 1995, we did not know why every single reform failed that they initiated in the great society. I will tell you there was one, Nolan Estes was superintendent of Dallas at the time, and he was wonderful because he, he was a friend with Lyndon, and he got unlimited money given to him for his work. And what he did was he, he tried every reform. He said it was the most joyous moment of our life. We had unlimited money and unlimited opportunity. They did it for a few years. They measured it, and nothing had happened. All right? <laughs> and he resigned <laughs> and went somewhere else. He just said, there's no way. That's what happened. So for 30 years, we failed until Hart and Risley told us why. What they found was that it's strictly a vocabulary problem. The number of words spoken to the child by the parents is a function, direct function, of how well they will do 
when they enter kindergarten in terms of their language. So they actually found all kinds of correlations to IQ and things, but to put it bluntly, the, the poorest class by the age four has only heard 13 million words, the working class 26 million, and the professional class, which most of you are part of, is 45 million words. So they also break down into comments so that the welfare class got only about two-thirds of the comments made to the children as negative. Now, you should read this carefully because it's a little more complicated. I'm oversimplifying. But the, the, the professional families is six to one positive. So while you got one group of kids getting beaten down primarily and the other being encouraged, and then the other encouraged group is also learning about abstract symbol sets. The parents love abstract symbol sets. And so they teach them how to solve problems, and they get into that mode. It absolutely makes it so unfair. Hart and Rizzi didn't know what to do. They were so discouraged when they were done that they came up with a plan. You know what their plan was? Take all children away at birth. <laughs> <laughs> bring them to a local center a few hours a day and have professionals talk to them, then bring them home. All right? If we do that, we'll get them up to the blue collar level, possibly, <laughs> if we do it for years, all right? You know how I heard about it? I'm following two professors at a triple SR. Triple SR is the Society for the Scientific Study of Reading. It's the real, the real McCoy. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this great, I'm following these two great professors at night. They're going to poster sessions where they're looking at graduate students. And I'm trekking along behind them trying to see what they're gonna be saying. And out of the blue I hear one say to the other, what happened to, Mar to Marilyn or the girl I sent you who's a terrific graduate student? She had a nervous breakdown. How did she have a nervous breakdown? He said, Hart and Risley. He said, oh, hell, I'm so sorry. She learned about them, and they walked on. I didn't know what it meant, so I raced home <laughs> and bought everything on Hart and Risley. If it can cause a nervous breakdown, I was sorry I did because it almost caused a nervous breakdown for me because it turns out that it's so said already by the parents. Now, let's look at play out. If you don't have your vocabulary, you end. You actually start at the bottom there if it's, if it's the Baltimore school system, the poor students are starting off 26 percentile points below. That's the start because of that background. Then going up, what's very positive about this is everybody learns at school, contrary to what we think. They do grow. But you can have one of my favorite riddles, the way I put it in the book is, here's the riddle. Uh, what can cause two kids in, in June to be six months apart uh, in September. Well, this does. If the kid goes home with a good vocabulary and they chatter a lot, he keeps growing all, all summer. The other kid goes home and loses three months. They now got a six month span. And then we play it out over a number of years and that's what happens, do you see? So it's absolutely extraordinary watching what happens when you don't start them right. This is why the preschool years are so significant. It's all set, your trajectory is set. I kept the slides out that made me cry because I didn't want to burden you with them, but was in a New York City study that we did for years. It was so devastating, I literally sat and cried the day I got the data because it showed that you cannot catch up. You cannot catch up, period, all right? You would have to double your learning rate to, uh, to learn as fast as the others, but you gotta catch up so you have to double it a second time. We call it the 4X problem. How can a kid learn four times faster than the other members of the class? You just can't do it. It's all over by the end of the first or second grade. We have to go back. Marilyn has shown that the kids who uh, are not given pre-literacy training adequately See, you're, you, most of you in this room will have given your children 3,000 hours of pre-literacy program training. You'll read to them, put stuff on the refrigerator. I was going to say icebox, you can tell me. Uh, <laughs> put them on the icebox, you know, that kind of thing. 3,000 schedule sesame, you know, all that. The other families are getting between 20 and 200 hours. So it's, it's less than 7%, Maryland's data. The Samson Chicago study is devastating too. What they found was that in, to protect the black children, the parents were keeping them in off the street. But even if they stayed in a the family, nobody had the vocabulary. 
So they found that by the early elementary years, they had lost four IQ points because of this isolation away from academic vocabulary. They hoped if they moved to the suburbs that they could recover. They had a group that won lotteries and moved to the suburbs, and none of them improved. So you're losing, you're just, that four IQ is about two years of schooling, all right? B. Miller is sitting here, and here's a review of what we have to do in vocabulary, and I'll let you digest that later, but what it says is the 6,000 words is average, 4,000 words are the lower kids, and the 8,000 are the higher kids, and it's the 8,000 that trigger the Matthew effect. I'm sure you've all heard of the Matthew effect where those who have more is given, those who have not, it's taken away. They do this, they go like that. And this other group goes like that and they drop out. And so if you don't get started right, it's automatic. But it's the vocabulary behind it. And that's what Andy B. Miller was trying to work on, was improving that vocabulary. Here's the two sigma problem that Dexter talked about before. On the right high tutorial thing, we can, if we personally tutor a child, get them two standard deviations above what is normal, and notice that the worst kid there is almost in the middle of the competent group from the regular class, you see? So if you can hand tutor, you can do almost anything. It's absolutely spectacular. I want you to read the democracy tax. I'll not go through it, but I will say in one sentence, having studied the democracy tax where we prefer democracy over efficiency and have built all our processes to do that, it will be impossible for us to have great elementary schools. We have the greatest colleges in the world, but they're mediocre elementary schools, okay? And that's because of the democracy tax. And there are six points I've written about. You can look that up. This is important because there are two words that you might want to memorize for cocktail parties. One is cognitive skills versus non-cognitive skills. You can defang the preschool community if you give away non-cognitive skills as your chip, all right? You handle the non-cognitive, we'll handle the cognitive. Because they hold you at bay now by saying, you're not teaching age-appropriate things. In other words, you're making them learn. So uh, you've got to be very careful in your rhetoric with preschool community because a lot of them are dead set against any cognitive training. With technology, we can do the cognitive training and not have a problem. Can you follow that? So that's, that's my... Uh, just, it, it's a great way to make peace because really we can't handle non-cognitive skills very well. But they are equally or more important than cognitive skills. Discipline, patience, follow through, all of those things will determine how, how much they succeed as much as the cognitive. Enhanced educational software or comprehensive software is very different than the things we saw today that were so brilliantly portrayed by our speaker. Basically, an enhanced software is a very rich, full software that has individualized tasks all the way through. It has a total curriculum. It has music, art. It has songs. It has everything you can imagine. Now, the reason software is very difficult and why all of us will have a big problem is I put an equation in called C equals VIMS. You want to memorize that because it tells you why you can't make it in software. The cost is equal to the version that you have to modify every time your vendors change the software. So Microsoft and Adobe kill us every two weeks. It stops working. Teams of programmers have to resuscitate it. And so we spin, we develop something that costs a few hundred thousand dollars to develop. This year we're spending six million dollars maintaining it, all right? See the inverse law that kills you? Because we also have to, under the M, do our own improvement. We're going to version 5.0 so we can use the cloud. So you end up spending all this money on first the vendor's software maintenance and then your software maintenance. And then you have to have I as some improvement for the things you've discovered that are wrong. And finally, the size of the code is a direct function of how much. Every time we change it, we have to measure 70 gigabytes to see if it's impacting anything else in the program. So you, this is why it gets so expensive. And I just want you to be aware of that, that that's why there's not a lot of great software. We spent $135 million and took 15 years 
just for K1 and 2, all right? Now, we have found a fantastic solution, which we're calling the third source model. What we do is we do something called upstart, and what we do is we bring computers and software to the families of the children, and the legislature pays for it. So far, it's only part of the kids. We've maybe done a few thousand of them. But the results have been followed by a PhD thesis from Brigham Young University that was carefully refereed and followed through. And the results are absolutely stunning. What it simply means is that in addition to technology, you need the human component. So we have a group at the Institute. Those of you who are going over, you'll see the area. They take phone calls and emails all day long and stay in touch with these hundreds of kids, thousands of kids. And all we worry about is, can we get usage? Because I felt that if I can get them to use the hardware, the software will work. This is the first time I cried after that New York experience, because this was happiness. You see the dotted line running across there? This is the 75 minutes we asked for, 50 minutes a day for five days a week. You can see that they jumped above it the first year. They went tanked at Thanksgiving, went subprime at Christmas, and then started a gradual decline. But I averaged a close enough to get an effect size that was truly extraordinary. This year, as we learn how better to do it, notice the green did not go down at Thanksgiving or Christmas. And so far, we're pulling upward where the other is starting down. This is up to last week. I don't have the past week in it here for you yet, but absolutely extraordinary. So this gives me hope that says that I can anywhere in the world, we have this in Indian reservations, we have this in inner city families that no one speaks English, we have it with white suburban mothers who have three Subarus, uh, and, and, uh, and wh whatever you want to do, they are learning identically according to this dissertation research. Same speed, same amount. It's absolutely breathtaking. So I finally realized all of, I can just get it out there and have a team behind it. I can actually get these kids. The effect size is between 0.71 at the low end and 1.67 at the high end. Now, I put in some other effect sizes to give you a sense of, remember the 2.0 is paradise. We never got to 2.0 yet. We got to 1.67 for those who used it 20% more than we asked. But we think that maybe we'll get there a little closer as we get more efficient on, on motivating them. So what have I learned? The core issue is the training and stimulus of the child's brain. The child is growing his or her own brain depending upon the resources available in that child's setting. Dehane is the best brain guy I know. He's French. And he wrote a brilliant book on reading. And what he said is the core question gets down to this, quote, what is the appropriate stimulation strategy for optimal daily enrichment? So when I look at families and people and they talk about reforms or their, what they're doing in their lives with their kids, I ask one thing. Are they spending 15 minutes a day at least on something of significance? Because the brain needs to be trained. The general noise does not train the brain that well, all right? And nor do games. The games usually teach you how to do things strategically and you memorize them. Then you're tired of the game because you figured it out. But there are things, and actually, if you put myelin around the, uh, the brain cells, the axons, it builds up every day that you train. So think of piano practice. We say with our Upstart program, 15 minutes a day, brush your teeth, read your scriptures, and spend 15 minutes a day on this. That's the, kind of our prescription. We don't check on the scriptures, but, or the teeth. But it's got to be automatic. We don't want the mother even there necessarily. That's what's so wonderful. Just get 15 minutes is 1% of the day. So that shuts up all this stuff about saturation with technology. So point three, most schools are marginally equipped to offer the optimal daily enrichment. For starters, they're open less than half the days in a year. They cannot offer, as Dexter showed us brilliantly, individualized interactive instruction that's carefully sequenced and sustained on explicit and necessary targets. If you see any of those words used in sequence, you know you're dealing with the real deal. This is somebody who's worked with kids, round the clock, 
knows exactly what has to be done, and those are the phrases they use. They don't talk about age appropriate. Because what happens with age appropriate is the kids don't do things they're not supposed to yet. Cost structure of public schools is growing too rapidly to sustain economically. The current delivery system's tripled and so on and so forth. It's about as efficient as we're going to get it. Putting more money in isn't working. People are rebelling about the unions and the fat cats things and the job security and all that. So that's, that's going to stop the reform thrust in many ways. And if you heard Russ Whitehurst last night, the three-legged stool that they're funding, none of them work. He says, I don't know when they recognize it, what will happen, but <laughs> none of them work. We are fortunate in that we have transistors doubling in capacity at no cost every two years for the foreseeable future. We will soon have trillions of transistors working for each child, providing what is essentially limitless energy to help the teacher and parakeet educate. We are harnessing the speed of light, which is the fastest thing in the universe. Think of the Pony Express versus the Telegraph. We need to work with children in their homes with enhanced software in the preschool years to keep them in the game. I've long tried to find a better phrase and keep them in the game, but we've got to keep them in the game. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Please. <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you. Questions, please. No. <laughs> what bothered or incited you, or what, what do you wonder about? Well, I'm going to um, first ask you a question. Are these slides going to be available? Yes, they're, they're on the, they'll be put right on the website. And we'll, we'll also have some of the... Um, the, the TV things will be on too as well. So all of this is there for future analysis. Okay. Yes. I've never heard of you before. I, this is the first time I've been here. I'm amazed at what you have to say and what you've done. Um, and one of the things, I, I just a comment that I have to make is that um, in the preschool that I'm working with, one of the things that we found was as missing as technology was physical development. So we're putting in a physical development component and one of the problems I can see that this whole idea is gonna have is that people think that you're going to um, only concentrate on cognitive development um, through vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera, and the physical component is equally as important. Well, let me respond because that's an excellent question. Um, as a matter of fact, a uh, very important paper was published in 1921 by the uh, young director of the UCLA Learning Lab and Helen Keller. And they published a paper together on uh, the first paper on multisensory tutoring. And they, if the children had trouble learning, they would make them use all of their sensory capabilities. Obviously, you know why Helen Keller would understand that. But even teaching a letter A, if you put your arm up like this and imagine it in the sky, you're harnessing all these muscles, and they're sending signals too, and sometimes it gives an alternate route to the brain. You're reprogramming the brain to fit the physical aspects. If you do it in sand with your finger, she made them do that. She made them touch the board, write it, go over and over it, and say it. Say, touch, feel, large muscles, small muscles, or. And, and she had spectacular success. All of the good programs now that are multi-sensory tutoring for the children in trouble, one in five nationally will have reading difficulties. So it's 20%. We just got our data a couple weeks ago on our new group coming through. Uh, upstart, it's exactly 20%. All right, now what do we do at that point? We bring in a multi-sensory tutoring program. The children have to be doing this. They're, they're augmenting, touching, feeling, singing, dancing, you know, everything. That's the only way to do it. This gentleman is absolutely right. That the, the more senses you can bring to bear, the stronger the wiring. Remember the stunning insight of Sally Shaywitz at Yale, who did a lot of the first fMRI work. F means functional, so the kid is doing something functional. Then they do the MRI, and then they see where it lights up. And what she said is, I could not believe it, but I'm watching us rebuild the brain <laughs> as we do sensory you know, tutoring 
uh, and helping this kid with multi-sensory approach, all right? So remember that. There are, there's the Orton-Gillingham method. There's the uh, Wilson method. There are very, the Slingerland approach. There are lots of people who use multi-sensory tutoring when the children get into trouble. But the, the, all children, if you can give them as much of this as possible, it really programs the brain better than any other way possible. Remember, you're building a machine in your head. That's what this French, great French said. He said, we're building a precision machine. And the more you build it and polish it, the, another guy found there's a 3,000 fold improvement in throughput when you give daily stimulation and build up that myelin properly sheathing. And it's like a copper wire getting sheathing, all right? Insulation, all right? That's what you're doing when you, that's why I said from the beginning, the only thing I listen to new now is, what are you doing daily? that will work on the things that the kid truly needs. Next question. Yes. Can you say a little more about the Upstart program? Yes. What areas in the Upstart program are actually addressed in 15 minutes of that day? Uh, primarily reading, when I say advanced uh, math and science. Thank you. Uh, it's our full curriculum. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Now, what happens, of course, is they don't all quit at 15 minutes. We're averaging closer to 17 or 18 or 19 minutes, 22 minutes. And so they start, after a while on reading, they start rolling and doing math and science. But the key thing here is to get them ready. The way they came in, our, our promise was if this is the start of kindergarten, and this is first grade here, we would bring him in ready here. And, and many of this population, the rural, uh, were not getting that before. We average our children coming in the last third of kindergarten and first third of first grade, just with 15 minutes a day, all right? That's, uh, it's only 1% of the day, so it gets pretty hard to be critical. And obviously, they work in bursts. Uh, you heard Russ say last week, he never told me that story, but when he had his child, when he went swimming, on their vacation, and his child was having difficulty with reading, and I gave him some of the materials to play with. And after a few days, he began to get it. We, we then dumped them into a multi-sensory tutoring program that we have if they're failing. It, we've just made the calls already for this coming year. And the parents are being shifted over to the multi-sensory tutoring program. So it, it's very helpful to, uh, so that's what they get. If they get into trouble, they have multi-sensory tutoring. And we get incredible comments and calls I mean, uh, the multi-sensory tutoring will show them how to, you know, with, with machines and things, how to do blending. And we get, a mother will call us in hysterics saying, I just can't believe it. I watched my child learn to read today. You know, it happened today. You know? <laughs> I even got a letter from a mother whose child drowned. And they, uh, they brought him back to life, but not much action. And when he got on the terminal one day, because his brothers had it, he began to come back, and then she... He made up a year and a couple of months, uh, and so they, they, were, they had high hopes. So we, we see all kinds of uses for it, but this is an early science. I mean, I was stunned to find that in the dissertation at Brigham Young, they predicted 55% of the kids would work 20% between the expected and 20% more. And this past week, we, when I saw the last round of our statistics for the past week, 56%. <laughs> I mean, it's starting to become a science. It'll take us years to make it a true science. But we're learning how to, we do three things. We, 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 we monitor, we motivate, and we measure. And we, we had 17,000 telephone calls, half from the parents and half from us the first five months. And the emails, of course, go out weekly. And we send training disks over the wire so that they can also get trained. And we have it in Spanish and in English. Um, you, you showed us uh, that there was quite some variation in the effect size of the uh, up, Upstart program. Um, can you say something about what could be the cause of these, this big variation? I think that uh, we tracked it mostly to the amount of time spent on it. So that 
the, the, the 0.71 was people who used it, but not, not too much. We, we knocked off the lowest end and the top end. You traditionally do that because the outriders. But generally speaking, it was just a question of the usage. So the, the group down at this level did 0.71, which is the same as IQ, incidentally. <laughs> and then it, it went up to about 1.67. I have hopes that if we get the usage up for a full year and uh, are better motivated, learn how to talk to them better, I hope we can get to that 2.0 that Dexter uh, told us about. Uh, Dexter has been talking about the two sigma problem since I met him. I really call it the three sigma problem. The last third of it is for Dexter. But you noticed on his slide how brilliant that work of Bloom is. That if you actually tutor a child one on one and you know what you're doing, you'll get a two, two, two sigma or uh, two standard deviations more than the average child. And that is absolutely, that's our goal, what we're hoping to get. Um, yes? You said you cried the second time for joy when you saw the statistics. Yes. How many children is Upstart affecting right now? Well, it's what, it's what we got funded. So that, at that point, it was just only 1,500. What can we do to help the other millions of children that are still on the Pony Express? Well, what, what we're trying to do is find the state legislatures, do pilot programs with them, and then try to get it to extend throughout. Because we're not trampling on anybody's reign. I mean, we're not running anybody's parade or whatever the hell it is. Uh, <laughs> if we take them at home when they're four, they can still go to preschool or not. It doesn't matter. On the Indian Reservation, they were two hours from the nearest preschool. So, I mean, but what is so electrifying and so exciting, and the reason I cried is that you, there are two powerful things we're dealing with. The number of transistors working for you and the speed of light. With the speed of light, I can get there instantaneously, wherever, I mean, all over the world. Some parents have written, they say it's so wonderful when we fight, the kid goes and just, <laughs> you know. But, that child is suddenly getting world-class curriculum as if an expert were present. That's what's so wonderful about it. But it's the speed of light I've harnessed. It's instantaneous to get there. Do you see? And we can correct the curriculum, too, overnight. We tracked at our school, when we did the original research for our reading program, we completed it by 1990, and Marilyn Adams was dragged out to be our primary consultant. Um, we had about six or seven others come as well, all of whom had great international reputations. But it took us, after that, it spread through our school and we got them going well on the latest reading research. A faculty member joined us from a local school district, got so excited by it, she was just thrilled to learn all this new material, went back and told the superintendent and her principal how spectacular it was, thinking they'd be excited. They threw her out. Uh, nice, that's nice, dear. Go home, will you? Uh, we're running schools here. It took them, she's measured it, it took them 15 years before they got to the level that we had. So the dispersion of knowledge is going to be huge. Every time a researcher finds something new that we can put in, it will be in there overnight. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Now, we don't have the full resources to do all of that that rapidly, but you can just see it coming. It is so very exciting and hopeful. Anyway, I cried because I realized I can do it. I really can do it. If they give me, because we know it takes about 1,100 minutes before they separate from the growth of the rest of the class, and they do this. We've never found a shoulder yet, all right? And our software is going to get better. I mean, as soon as we finish all the B. Miller work that we're doing for vocabulary, we're going to slide that in. <laughs> uh, you know, so there's, it's just going to get better and better. But to see and understand that it can be done, I mean, we had this out to all the families within about two or three weeks. We didn't have to build buildings, train faculty, or do anything. Just like that. That's why I cried. Thank you very much.